morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Friday. All oh, right. Uh, second week of class. <laughs> and the second week of class. Um, and so today we're going to wrap up our discussion of the Fred Abstract. We're going to talk a little bit about, um, we're going to finish up from last time a couple of things about context switching that we didn't get to. We're going to talk about uh, what a thread is, right? You guys pretty much know this now, but I think it, it's worth sort of covering at home a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit about maybe why you want to use threads in a program, right? And, and how threading differs as a programming model for handling concurrency from forking out multiple files. Then we're going to talk about threading implications, because this is kind of an interesting uh, design discussion here. So you can implement threads in the user space. We'll talk about how, show you some examples. Uh, you can also implement them in, in the kernel, which is more common now. Uh, both of those have their pluses and minuses, so we'll talk a little bit about, about what those are and why. Right? Because, and actually, I think this is a good discussion to have because it, it helps drive home some of the, you know, the, the key things that we've been talking about: context switch overhead, uh, state, and, and uh, overhead associated with state. Like so some of the pros and cons here. If you understand the pros and cons of user space versus kernel threading. You really managed to internalize some of what we've been talking about, which is the point, right? And then finally, we're going to uh, finish up today with talking about thread states. So we have this sudden abstraction, and one of the things that uh, we can do with abstractions is we can start to you know, talk about them as these sort of independent things that can be doing something that can be in, in different states relative uh, to the system, and we'll talk about what those states mean and, and what they mean, right? And that's it. So assignment zero is completely out. Everything's up there. Um, I, when I, I was releasing it, I was poking around a little bit, and uh, you know that there was there were not very many people who had uploaded uh, GDB scripts, which makes me a little bit nervous. So um, you know, the, the assignment zero is out, and and you know, assignment zero is not supposed to be hard either. Actually, if you're struggling with assignment zero, um, I would encourage you to come to office hours, send an email to the staff, get help now because stuff ramps up really fast, and assignment one which we're going to release on Monday, is much more difficult than assignment zero. You haven't actually written any real code for assignment zero. The stuff we're asking you to do for assignment zero, oh, you've got to put in some debug statements or something. I mean, that is easy piece of stuff, right? For assignment one, you're going to actually have to build a little bit of stuff in the kernel. It's going to have to work. And that is, you know, that, that's when the bar starts to come up. And then assignment two and assignment three just kind of keep going, right? So this class builds on itself, and the assignments get more difficult and more challenging as we go through the semester. So again, you know, I, right now, I mean, we're in this kind of weird intermediate period where you guys haven't turned anything in, so I can't tell, you know, what, what's going on. But if you need help, if you're struggling, if there's things that you are really don't understand, please email us. You know, we're not always going to answer your question, right? And maybe that will frustrate you, but part of what you need to learn to do in this class and in general in, in you know, your, your programming life in the future is find ways to access resources online. So maybe other classes have said, oh no, you can't use Google or whatever. Use Google, right? I mean, there's a lot of great resources out there about Git, there's a lot of great resources about GED, there's a lot of tutorials about you know, how to use various command line tools, so go find those things, right? I mean, you shouldn't think that the material, as far as the programming assignments are concerned, there is not enough up there to teach you how to do anything that we're asking you to do. Some of the stuff you will have to go and find out for yourself. That's part of the, that's part of the journey, that's part of the fun, right? Okay, so a couple of other things. Um, we, so we're, we're trying to adjust the recitation, uh, the recitation. So there were two issues with the recitations. One was uh, four, I think, is, is probably one more than is ideal for this class. And, and you know, poor Sonali here has to essentially regurgitate the same material four times, right? So you know, if, if you feel some pity on her and you imagine you know, if I had to give the same lecture four times a week, I think by the end it would get really weird because I would be trying to amuse myself by making things uh, different, right? Um, so I think that maybe we'll try to cut it down to three. Uh, the ADM recitation is popular. That recitation, I think, is going to stay put. Um, the others are all sort of candidates to move around. The other problem with the recitations was one of the rooms didn't have a projector in it, which is fantastic. Uh, we think it's another problem is often she went there to teach. So uh, we're going to look for a room with the projector. We've already... So we have already moved two of the recitations. And again, if the Tuesday noon recitation, that one, according to Sonali, was not that well attended. So that one might go away. But both the Thursday 8 a.m. and Tuesday 12 p.m. recitations are now in Davis 113, right? It's a much nicer room. It's in our building. 
And so, you know, we've, we've done that. I'm going to actually try to get all of the recitations in Davis if I can. Um, but, but for now, those two are definitely moving. All this stuff's updated on the website now, so if you have questions, go there. Um, and yeah, so we'll probably put a poll up on the website. Please, you know, if, if you can make a recitation, and we ask if you can make a recitation, say you can make a recitation. Right? We're going to try to find three recitations at three times that cover the entire class. Right? So please do it, you know, you help us out. And, and check off recitations that you can attend, not the ones that you'd like to attend the most. Um, Okay, the office hour schedule has also changed around a little bit. The website now has video on it, so all the videos up to yesterday's lecture are up there. Uh, and we're going to kind of keep adding things, like might be some other videos as well today, in terms of maybe a screencast, looking at uh, people off the assignment a little bit, or some other things. But, but anyway, so, so you know, uh, keep up to date on the website, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to do stuff as well. The slides are, are coming, there's still like a little bit of an annoying process for me to go through to get the slides up online. Um, and yesterday I was consumed with other things. So the slides for Wednesday and slides for today, I'll probably put them Saturday. All right. So Wednesday, questions about Wednesday. Wednesday we talked a little bit about the limitations <coughs> to the CPU that the operating system tries to address. We talked about concurrency, the illusion of concurrency. And we talked about context switching, the mechanism that makes the illusion of concurrency possible. So questions on any of this material? Yeah, Carl. So just real quick, um, I was online. So, well, okay, so here's what I would say, right? This is my class, so I get to make it up. Um, context switching is a mechanism by which we implement CPU multi. If we weren't able to switch between the right contexts, we couldn't actually multiply the CPU, right? Or, or we could, but we'd have to go back to this old batch schedule idea where we'd have to run something until it finished, let it you know, stop, you know, and, and then reload the loop. So the ability to switch contacts, right? And, and again, if, if you look in, in, in MIPS, there are some hardware, some hardware features that allow that, right? So things like the kernel-only register, those are hardware features that's designed to enable this. So that when a kernel starts running, it's got a little bit of space that it can use before it saves all the other registers that the kernel needs, right? Also, the exception PC is another feature that's built for that, right? So when I start executing in the kernel, I don't blow away where the thread that was executing the exception may not happen a lot. But again, I, I, I think of context which is a mechanism, right, that allows us to multiply. Does that make more sense? Yes. All right, any other questions? It's a good question. All right, so, yeah, I've got question. Right, right. So, so, right. Okay. Good question. Uh, yes. So, um, remember, remember what we talked about before. Um, there, there are these, there are these hardware interrupts, right, which are generated by devices. Okay. And if I'm a user application, I can be running along, and a hardware interrupt can happen, and the I can switch into kernel mode, and I didn't cause it, right? Maybe I, maybe I kind of caused it. Maybe I was the one who initiated the disk reading, but. I didn't cause it by executing an instruction, right? Whereas with IPC, IPC, when you're talking about you know, pipes in particular, is implemented using what? What, 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 do I, what do I do to implement it? Right, and what if I want to read and write? What are it? No, I know what that is. I know, I know, I know what, what they're reading and writing, but what, what are reading and writing? Uh, I think they are. So in order to perform a read and a write, I have to use this as a call instruction, which means that I am asking the CPU to do something. I'm sorry, I'm asking the kernel to do something. So I think the difference between uh, scheduling, right? Scheduling is called by timer, right? Which are not under the application's control. Whereas asking the kernel to do something for me to write or read to a pipe using a system call is. So that's why I, I think that's a good example of the difference between, you know, non-volitional context switching, right? Where I got stopped and then restarted later. And to the thread that was running, it doesn't look like anything. Else. Right? And volitional context switching, where I give up control because I'm asking the kernel to do something about that. Right? All right, any other questions? They're good questions. 
Yeah. Um, to the notion of concurrency you're talking about, those yep. guys. Um, so it basically came down to like a timer interrupting every very often. Right? Sure. Um, so that means every time you want to switch in between each small piece of each program, you had to go through all the process of saving the state and all of that. We're, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. I think I know where you're going with this. Because that seems expensive. Yes, and we, we're going to talk about that in a second. As soon as I get to the review. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great point. And it's an, interesting, it's an interesting point that points out one of the trade-offs we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Yes, I can. And I will do that next week. Right. So next week we're going to talk about second right? And that's fun. That's fun stuff, actually. This, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I like all this stuff. But I think synchronization next week will be good. It's the fun of it. Right. And you guys, you guys are going to experience that. Right? You will probably deadlock your system multiple times in the course of doing this. Right? Or, yeah, how does the uh, DMA fit into this? Are we going to be talking about that in this class? Uh, yeah. What are we talking about now? We, we can talk about DMA. And, and yeah, actually, we will, we will talk. We will talk about it. We'll, 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 we'll look at that. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Great questions. It's good. It's good. All right. So let's do a review. A transition between two threads. This is all day. Everybody. All right. What are some problems with the CPU that the operating system tries to address? Now, everyone, think about the question for a minute. Start back here. What, what's one problem with the CPU? Oh gosh, it's really first I guess I can't pick any. Over here. What's one limitation of the CPU that the operating system is going to try to run? What about speed? Speed is a part of one of the answers, but what, what specifically? Can you help me out? Right, and, and okay, no, okay, so, so CPUs are expensive, but what does that mean? All right, let's keep going. Any ideas? No ideas at all. Uh, all right, here. No, so, so speed and cost are part of two of the answers, but they're not the answers. Do you want to venture a guess? One. It's coming back to you. Like multiple processes running systems, something like that. I can't think. Over here. There are fewer less CPUs. Right. There are fewer CPUs. I don't have enough CPUs. That's the most fundamental limitation. Right. I don't have enough. I only have one or two or maybe four cores or eight cores or even sixteen cores. But I've got a lot of threads that need to run. A lot of things that are trying to happen. Or look like that. What's the other limitation? You were getting close to the seat. Go somewhere to see. There's only so much. Okay, so that's, so, that, that, so that's a good answer. It's not the answer I'm looking for. Right? There, are, there are usually a limited number of NRL lines. And usually, sometimes any NRL has to be shared. Actually, help high latencies from the CPU. Memory, not so much. Okay, memory is just handled as part of the one. But other devices, right? If if the CPU had to wait around for these devices to finish what they're doing, it would waste a lot of cycle, right? Okay. Batch scheduling. What is batch scheduling? Just talk a little bit about something that would be a problem. Yeah. 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 Ye
if, if it's just like hung up waiting for one of the processes, it can't do anything else with the resources? Well, it wouldn't be waiting for a process, it would be waiting for a device. Right. So if, if a batch if a batch schedule process does I.O., the CPU just sits there doing nothing, potentially, until the I.O. Right. So this is one of the issues that. Okay. Slow device is going to handle the CPU. The illusion of concurrency. This is one of those you know, matrix X things that the operating system does. Right? So how do I, how do I implement that illusion right here? Maybe she doesn't know. You want to help her? What's that? Scheduling the process. Scheduling, but, but more fundamental than that. Right? That to time you, it looks like two processes are running at the same time. But what's really happening? Yeah. Uh, time uh, multiplexing. Time multiplexing. Right. So I'm switching back and forth very rapidly, right, past the limits of human <coughs> perception to allow multiple devices, multiple processes to get useful work done at quote unquote at the same time. It seems synchronous to you, but on the uniprocessor system, keep in mind, there is never more than one thing happening, right? And on an eight-core system, there's never more than eight things happening at the same time. To you, you might think you have 30 different things open, right? But that's not what's actually happening. What's actually happening is that things are getting shared very intelligently. And we'll come back to this in a week when we talk about scheduling. The scheduling is the policy that tries to make sure that this looks concurrent and not slow. Okay. How does the operating system ensure that it retains control over what threads are running? What, what do I do? Yeah, right. Uh, it goes into protective mode. Right, but how does it get into protective mode? What sends it into protective mode? Kernel trap. What? Kernel trap. Kernel trap caused by? An interrupt caused by a? I hear it, I hear it. Timer, right? So to ensure that I get a chance to stop a task, a process from running, you know, I might have a process that just isn't a while one move. If there's no I.O. going on, that process is never going to give up the CPU all the period. To make sure that I get back. Because there's time all of time. What's that? Or like if you just do handle a lot of time. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, OK, so let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's be clear here, right? In this class, we are talking about the idealized operating system. <laughs> the idealized operating system that, that over 50, 60 years, I would say that we have managed to build a lot, right? But this is what the average system is trying to do, not always what it actually manages to accomplish. Right? And in particular, you guys will have fun with this when you start building your own, your own system. All right. Let's see. So when I actually perform a context switch, what do I need to say? What is the state I need to say to perform a context switch? Um, program counter, pretty much all okay, program counter is one. one but the program counter is actually an example of a register. Right? What else? Stack. 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 Anything else? No. Oh, I gave it away. Somebody was going to. Registers that the thread was using when the interrupt occurred, and, and the stack to actually. Of course. All right, any other questions about this? Any other questions about currency? We're going to do a little bit more of what's going to look like with you today. Hopefully it will be okay. All right. So let me finish up with some of the material that we didn't cover about context switching on Wednesday. Right? So a couple of details about context switching. When a thread begins running in the kernel, it does not continue to use the stack that the user thread was using. Why? Or why not? Any ideas? Why wouldn't I keep using this, the user stack? What would happen if I kept using the user stack? Well, it could be an overflow, but let's say I don't blow the stack. You know, I'm good. I don't call like this massively recursive function. I just do a little work and I go away. What? What else? There's two problems here. Uh, yeah. Probably you'll have to reload at the no, uh, unload and reload the stack when you switch to the operating uh, thread again. Right. So the first problem is that I could make a mess. You know. I might change the state of the stack. And remember, when I restart the thread, that stack has to be exactly the way it was when the interrupt happened. Uh, There's another problem here. But, yeah. uh, this, uh, this, this is the case with any context switch, right? Yes. So in any context switch, we have to replace the stack, correct? Right. Every time I trap into the kernel, I start using, so if, if you look at OS161, every thread is a kernel stack. And that's the stack that is like one page or something. And that's the stack 
that, that the users when it's running in the code. Right? But what's the other problem with using the user stack? We've hinted at this before. What, is, what does the kernel not do security. to processes? Yeah, security. I don't trust the process. I don't trust anything about it. I don't trust the arguments it has me. I don't trust its memory. <clears throat> Nothing. Right. So if I was starting to try to use its stack, I would basically be trusting its memory. And who knows what it's set up on the stack to try to trip me up. Right. So first, I don't want to make a mess. Second, it's not safe. Right. Yeah. What does the stack contain? Okay, so this is this is good. So I don't. Here, here's the thing. And, and I think that this this is not just you guys, but um, it, that sometimes I think that this kind of stuff is getting missed in early programming classes. And I can't completely address this in this class. But if you're curious about how the stack is used, particularly across function calls, I encourage you to find out. Right? Go online, look it up, look at some examples of what happens. So in a nutshell, what, is, what does the stack contain? So first of all, the stack contains any local variables that you allocate. So in C, if you allocate a variable in a function that's local to the function, that variable gets stored on the stack. Meaning that when you enter that function, and you can look it up in the assembly code, the compiler inserts instructions to create space on the stack to hold that variable. That's, so, it, and, and if you wonder, you know, if I, so if I create a local variable in a C function, is that variable available outside of that function context? No. no. And the reason is because it's stored on the stack, and when I return from the function call, I go back up the stack, and whatever space I allocated to that variable is, is reused or is called. So when I make a function call, what happens is I push space onto my stack for the arguments, to the function. That's that's also how you pass arguments in C. And then I jump to another location, the code and start executing. And what happens over? So how many people have ever written a recursive function in C? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you guys have written a recursive function that that had a bug in it, so that it never had a base case and never continued recursing? Right. What happens when you do that? Right, you will have a stack overflow because what's happening is every time you make a function call, you're allocating more and 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 more space on the stack, and pretty soon the operating system. Now we'll talk when you get to memory. The operating system will give will hand out new stack pages to processes if it thinks that they're well behaved, right? Because processes do use their stack for things. But at some point, you know, the operating system is going to be like. This thread is allocated you know, four megabytes of stack, and that seems a little weird. So I think it's time for this thread to be done. And that's, that's what happens. So there, there are usually limits that you can set on the amount of stack space that a, that a process can allocate before. But, but if you write a recursive function without a base case, you will hit any limit, right? Like, you might overwrite the entire heap and overwrite all of the code and, and try to, I mean, at some point, you're going to also run out of memory eventually, right? Because it's unlikely that you have 32. You know, or sorry, four gigabytes. Well, maybe now you might have four gigabytes, but it's unlikely that you have enough memory to, 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 to push the stack to the pointer all the way down to the bottom of your graphics. So this is what happens. But, but there, is, there are going to be times in this class, especially in the programming assignments, where you're going to need to know a little bit about the mechanics behind how this is done in C. Right? So there's a programming assignment, for example, where we tell you store this variable on the thread stack. And there are people in the past when we told them to do that, they said, oh, I don't want to do that. And then we thought, well, Something's going to be missed, right? So, if, if you, you should, if you're confused about how this works, I encourage you to find out. All right. So, and then again, so the the equivalent we, we saw on Wednesday, the code that pushes the registers to perform a context switch, and you can find the, the corresponding code that that unloads those registers once the context switch is is over. And and so, and I told you there's this MIP, there's this MIPS instruction that generates a software interrupt. What is that instruction? David, what's that? Syscall. 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 Syscall generates a software interrupt. There's an equivalent instruction on MIPS that is called RFE, or return from exception, that performs kind of the opposite thing. It takes the processor back into user mode, jumps back to a certain portion, and starts executing instructions. So this is what happens. So when I enter the kernel, application calls Syscall, I push all the registers, I do some work, 
when I'm finished, I'm leaving, I pop the registers back off the stack, I, I load all the registers that the process was using, and then the last thing I do is I call R F. And you can see all this code, it's all there. Okay, so back to the point that you made before about timer. What do you mean? Calvin? Calvin. You have to work. Uh, I'm going to have to be able to call on you on Monday. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there are, uh, is there only one kind of software interrupt or uh, like uh, different uh, needs may be uh, requiring right. different ISRs? So just one SS call? So, okay, so that's a good question. Is, is there, it depends on what you mean, right? So is there, is there just one system call? Let me ask that question. Is there just one system call? No. No. We talked about four system calls last week, right? And there's like, 30 more. So, but there is only one syscall assembly instruction. So how does, how do you think the user process tells the kernel which system call it wants to perform? Passes an argument. Passes an argument. And actually, somebody stopped by my office last week and we actually looked at this code together. And if you look at the hand, well, I'll put this up. There's a handout about the MIPS architecture. And if you look, there's a register that it is agreed upon that when I call system call, I load a number identifying the system call that I want to perform into this particular register before I call the system call. Right? And then based on which system call I'm trying to do, there are other arguments that will be put in other places. And you guys will find out in, in great detail how this works for assignment two because you will actually have to, have to pull those arguments into the kernel and process them. Right? Okay, so back to context majority. Yes, context switches are not free. Context switches are actually pretty expensive. And on, on more mature systems, they've gotten even more expensive because there's a lot of stage associated with the process. And there's a lot of things that I need to sort of save and, 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 and make sure that things happen. So the context switching establishes a cost, right, to enter the kernel, which you know means, you know, again, cross this user kernel boundary, start to execute kernel code, make a system call, right? Process a hardware. And as Calvin pointed out, what does this mean about timer interrupts? So what if, so you, you might think, you know, this, this solution of concurrency is great, right? And, you know, I can make it even better. I can generate timer interrupts. So maybe I have a timer on the system that generates interrupts every 10 milliseconds, right? I can make the system seem even more concurrent by generating timer interrupts every 1 millisecond or 100 microseconds or 10 microseconds. What's the problem? You have to say, uh, message you have to uh, escape space. Well, it's not that I have to save more per context switch, but the overhead is constant for each context switch, right? So as I increase the number of timer interrupts, the overhead of context switching will start to dominate the amount of time that I actually am able to spend running. Right? What is, the system doesn't want to just spend time pushing in, you know, popping registers. It wants to allow applications to do useful work, right? Yeah? Does it have a threshold at which it would stop? So, so it's, it's not really an issue of the busyness of the CPU. It's more an issue of granularity, right? So what most systems do is they pick a timer interval that is short enough so that I can implement concurrency, so I can provide that illusion. If the timer, if the timer interval was like one second, right, what would your computer feel like, you know? It would play an MP3 for one second, and then it would load the web page for one second, and then it would play the MP3 again. And it'd be, it'd be really awful, right? So it's got to be fast enough that it can actually fool you into thinking that a bunch of things are happening at the same time, right? But it, ha it can't be so fast that the context switch overhead starts to dominate. So there is a balance there, right? And systems essentially, I mean, you do two things. One is you try to make sure that the context switch overhead is as small as possible, right? You don't want to do, you know, um, I, I worked one summer at, at Microsoft in, the, in, a, in, a, in one of the core, sort of core Windows kernel uh, performance groups. And I, I was working at desktop performance, which is kind of a different issue. I'll talk a little bit about that if you guys are curious. But, but there was a server performance group, right? And the server performance group, I mean, these guys, essentially well, a lot of what they do, I would say all of them, a lot of what they do is they hunt for ways to optimize these critical paths, right? So if these guys can find one instruction that they can remove from you know, what they would call a hot path, right? A piece of code that's going to execute billions of times. You know, they go out and have beers and stay home for a week. 
right? <laughs> because they may, have, they may have sped the system up by a huge amount. When we get to, we're going to talk a little bit about performance in this class, and actually there's a good performance story on this slide as well. But, you know, if you can optimize just a little bit a piece of code that runs all the time, you can have a huge speed up, right? So taking one cycle out of a, crit of a hot critical path where the web server is hitting millions of times a second is more effective than removing a thousand cycles from a piece of code that never gets hit. And this is one of the common mistakes people make when they try to improve the performance of their system to attack with long All right, so, so right, so there is a balance here between the yeah. yeah, so what is the practical result like with the uh, MIPS CPU? How many, I don't know, can you give us a rough idea about how many cycles does the OS allocate per thread and then how many cycles per handling the interrupt, yada, yada? Right, right, well, okay. Here, here, I, I'm not going to answer that question because I don't know off the top of my head. But you can find this out. And actually, this is configurable on your system. <coughs> so I'm in sys161.com, which you guys will have to edit a little bit. Or maybe, I can't remember if it's there or somewhere else. But you can set the timer rate, right? The rate at which timer interrupts fire. And you play around with it, right? Try setting it to something really low. And then try setting it to something really high. So, and one of the things we do for assignment one to test your code is we set that rate up higher <coughs> because it creates more synchronization problems because there's more <coughs> opportunity for, for things that you don't want to have happening at the same time. So this is configurable and you can figure it out. You can actually profile your system too and figure out how long it takes for competition. Count the, count the number of instructions that people do this. But off the top of my head, sorry, yeah. Uh, so the context should also depend on the application because the memory, say, who processed memory, how much memory, how much context, the last active. Right, right, right. So, so remember, I don't, you know, I don't have to save the stack. That's the good thing, right? I just leave the stack where it is. The stack's already in memory, so I don't actually have to copy anything normally, right? It's different than fork. Fork potentially has to do a lot of copying, right? To do a context switch, I don't actually, hopefully, I don't have to copy. But, but the overhead is, is getting a register state. Here. We're we'll come back to this issue when we talk about scheduling. All right. So, okay, so again, we're sort of, let's, let's back up a second. So we've, we've had this contact, uh, you know, conversation about contact switching and stuff. So, but let's come back. I mean, what, what is a threat? Threat is an abstraction. We're going to talk about threads as if, if it's some real thing. But what is a threat? What does a threat consist of? <laughs> CPU state and? Piece of code running on CPU. It, it, well, okay, so that's the idea of it, but, but what? The most granular piece of code. What's that? The most granular piece of code. So that's what a thread is. Light yes, light that's light true. Lightweight process. What's that? Lightweight process. Okay, so that's what Linux calls them, right? <laughs> um, but that's good. It's good to know because it's a little bit of a confusing term. So register state, and then what's the other thing that makes up a, a thread? A stack. Register state and stack. That's what the thread is. Okay. So now let's go through this a little bit of review with a picture. Okay, so. And I'm just going to ask you guys, for each one of these pieces of state, is it private to a thread? Is it private to a process? Or is it shared between potentially multiple processes? So what about registers? Okay. Private to a thread. Right? So they live up here in these, in these little threads. What about the stack? Private, actually private to a thread. And I will admit, and I did look this up, and I should have, but it's part of the address thing. Right, meaning that I'm not sure if it's the I'm not sure if it's actually enforced that threads can't write to each other's stacks. I think that might vary based on the implementation. But I admit that I didn't have time to look it up, and I should have. But you can. The idea is that a stack should be private to a thread. There might be cases where you want to share information between thread stacks, but that 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 might not be advisable. So a thread wants a thread needs some state other than the registers that can, can constitute its view of memory. Right? All right, memory. The rest of the address space. Yeah. Private to the process, meaning what? It's shared between threads, right? So every thread, I should have had more than one thread here. Every thread shares the heap, every thread shares the code that's loaded into the address space. And it's the sharing that makes multi-threaded programming right? What about the file descriptor channel? Shared between threads, private to the process, right? And the file handles, if I put them on here, can potentially be shared. Okay. Questions about this? I think this is important to develop a mental model of what stuff is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that in exec, uh, this file descriptor table is not modified. Right. So 
then that means that two processes are sharing file descriptor table as well. Right, so, no, no, they don't share the file table, they share the file handles, right? So they share the objects that the file table points to. <coughs> but they have separate, okay, they have separate copies of same things? So I copy the file table initially when I fork, right? And that means that I have these objects, and I wish I had the whole slide, that have two, potentially two pointers to them by separate processes. But when I modify, when a process opens files or, mod, or you know, opens or uh, you know, dupes file handles, closes file handles, all those operations are local to its own file table, right? So I can remove the pointer to that shared file handle and point it somewhere else, right? But I can't change the other guy's file. All right, any other questions? There's one over here. Maybe, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, I have a question about the heap. Uh, do you mean uh, data structure like a tree or just some random structure with a dynamic allocated memory space? Yeah, so, so the heap is used. So, so we haven't talked about VM yet, right? But does anybody know how, how do I create uh, memory objects in the heap using C? Malloc. Okay. Malloc, right? Malloc creates, Malloc allocates memory in the heap and returns a, a pointer to it to the process that called, to the thread that called. <laughs> But all the, so the heap is shared memory. Any thread can read and write. Because I'm a little bit uh, confused about the data structure, because they also have a heap, which is a tree structure. Basically, I have an older. Don't worry about, so, so for the purpose of this, of this class, the heap is an area of the address space. That's all it is. There's no data structure implied. There's a lot of different ways to implement memory allocation in the heap. But to the operating system, the heap is just a part of the address space that I'm allowing the process to use, okay? And again, we'll come back to this when we talk about memory, and there's, there's a special system call that is designed to allow the process to ask for more heap. What the process does with that heap is the kernel doesn't care, and it doesn't help. So implementations of malloc and free can use a lot of different data structures, but those are all done in user space <coughs> So heap, right? So heap is used over and over again. But in this class, right, the heap is an area of the address space that the process has permission to read and write, right? And again, we'll come back to this when we're talking more about address space. Yeah. So the, the heap is not completely unstructured. I how would you be able to find exactly like if I require you know, 512 kilobytes? I mean, you wouldn't be able to, if you were completely unstructured, you wouldn't be able to find 512. So, so you're right, the heap is not unstructured, but the structure is up to the process itself. The operating system, all the operating system does with the heap is the process will say, I would like some more heap, please. And the, and the operating system will say, sure. And it will give the process permission to use those addresses. What you do with them, totally up to you. So again, the implementation of, of MAP is in the standard class. And it call, it, so behind the scenes, it asks, the operating system for more memory when it needs it, and then it figures out how to structure it. So you're right, so you can't allocate objects of various sizes, you can free things, you can use memory. So we will come back. This is one of those like nested loop situations where I just need you guys to suspend disbelief for a couple of weeks. We will talk about allocating. It's kind of fun. All right. Okay, so let me come back to this idea. So why, as a programmer, just from the perspective of, of writing, and we talked about this a little bit already, why, why use threads? Right? So we already talked before that there's a way to create new processes. Right? So if I, one, of the ways of, one of the ways of providing the notion of concurrency is to just create a bunch of processes and have them do a different thing. Why as a user space programmer would you want to use threads? Why would you want to have a process with multiple threads running? Because of Okay, so one of the problems with a single process is if I try to do I.O., I might block the thread that's doing I.O., however there are asynchronous operating system interfaces for doing I.O. So I could get around that. Right? I could get around clever. Right? The, they're not necessarily easy to use. Yeah? You don't have to spend time to create new process? So, right. So processes are, are potentially high overhead, right? And remember, what, what's the goal of the operating system with regard to processes? Two processes. We've talked about ways for processes to communicate, but in general, the operating system doesn't try to what? Isolate and protect them from each other, right? And that makes communication more difficult. Whereas if you fork a thread, hey, I mean, that thread can do anything you want, right? If it does something stupid, the whole process is going to die, right? But the thread, you know, thread, so threaded communication can be a little bit easier. But, but again, I mean, just think about it from a more conceptual view. Like, why would you use a thread, right? 
Why would you want the notion of preserving one? Uh, sharing address space. So it shares memory, but I'm trying to go up another level in terms of what kind of problems would you use threads to solve? Oh, yeah, that. Oh, uh, bad no, say like a GUI application, you can have your user interface running while you're doing something. Right. So there, there are applications where it's natural to think about things happening at the same time, right? And again, this is an illusion that you're asking the operating system to create and that you're exploiting. But it can be a good mental model to think, you know, yeah, so I'm going to talk about something, right? So basically, a good way of thinking about applications is to do multiple things, quote unquote, simultaneously. It would just be a good mental model. And to some degree, you know, there's a big, there's actually kind of a big debate in terms of design between using threads and events. And I don't want to talk about events at all, but events is a different way of implementing concurrency that, that, that doesn't use as many threads. But there's, there's some, the people who advocate the threading model will claim that threads are a good mental model for thinking about how some of okay? We talked about some of this other stuff. So the other thing is, state that is private to a thread can be a good way of encapsulating some information about, about what's happening in your process, right? So threads don't share everything. Right? Threads do have some private state, right? And if that private state is a good map for what your what your uh, application is doing, then this this could be a good track. And then finally, uh, something Mike pointed out: you, threads can help you hide delays caused by slow devices. So if one thread in a process blocks waiting for I/O, every thread of the process doesn't have to block. Right? Whereas a single threaded process, one thread blocks and everybody waits. Or, or there is nobody else, the only threat. So I, I found this example on Wikipedia. I, I'm not going to claim credit for it. Uh, and in, in general, I, I, I try to kind of eschew these metaphors um, because I think that the, the problem with these metaphors is that if you take them too far, they end up confusing you rather than helping you. But I actually think this is a pretty good metaphor for threats, right? So cooking, right? How many people have ever been to a, kind of a nice, fancy restaurant where there's, you know, like a large number of people in the kitchen. So this is a photo from one of my wife and my favorite restaurants in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which we were sad, sad to believe. And you know, at a really good restaurant, the ratio of cooks to diners actually starts to approach one to one, and sometimes even exceeds one to one. So at the at the famous at El Bulli, the famous restaurant in Spain, I think they, there was actually something like two cooks to each person that would be seated for a meal. Right. So, so there's a large number of cooks. They're all, and, and, and what, what are they trying to do? Well, they're trying to prepare one meal, right? One plate, even potentially one, one, you know, uh, element on that plate, right? They're all doing one thing at a time, right? They've got private state. What is their private state? Okay, well, that's right. Think of potentially public. Private state. What's your private state? No. Whatever you're thinking about in your head right now. I don't know. I don't think this guy's insane. Terrible plot. But whatever. That's private for you. So your own thought processes, right? That this is this is the private state. Right? This is the equivalent of kind of the, the register, right? For, for a quote. But they can communicate easily. How do they communicate? They talk. They say things. They shout. You know. They they they. You know. You've seen these like terrible cooking shows where things are always on fire and some guys on this like red face and and making someone else cry, right? So they, they, they can talk, right? And, you know, they, and they have to coordinate, right? They have to coordinate to get things done efficiently and, and, to, and to bring things together, right? And that coordination is, is going to be the topic next week, right? So, so anyway, this is not, I, I, I thought about this a little bit, and I couldn't find somewhere where the wheels came off in terms of it being a metaphor. So maybe if you find that, you know, I'm sure it breaks out. Of okay, so, um, so let's talk about some naturally multi-threaded applications, right? So, <coughs> Uh, we're getting a little bit low on time, so let me just, what about, the, what about a web browser, right? So if I have multiple threads in a web browser, what might those threads be doing? Then you can download So, so web pages, modern web pages, especially like if you use a terribly designed site like Hub, for example, <laughs> have like thousands of different things that it's trying to do, right? A web page might have images that come, you know, a web page might have eight images in it that all have to be downloaded separately. What modern web browsers do is they fork off a bunch of threads to request all those separately with separate sockets, and then as the data comes in, they assemble the page. Right? So that's one of the things that, that speeds page load. If you have one thread that was just going through connection by connection, making each request, you know that your, your browser would seem much slower than 
And the reason is why. There's I.O. delays, right? But I can fetch those four images at the same time, and they probably take roughly the same amount of time to fetch concurrently as they would fetch together, right? So web browsers, you could have several threads each open tab, and you load a page, you fork off a bunch of threads to, to, to grab each part of the page, and then sort of stitch them back together. And then a lot of scientific applications have these, what are called embarrassingly parallelizable workloads, right? Or embarrassingly parallel workloads, meaning that that there's, you can take this huge, you know, two terabyte data set that needs to be processed and essentially process it in one megabyte chunks by separate threads, maybe on separate processors, and there's almost no communication that's required to perform this task. So the less communication that's required, the easier it is, because essentially those threads, I mean, you could, you could take the, you know, two terabyte task and send half of it to one of Amazon's data systems, half of it to the other, and all you have to do at the end is, like, add two numbers to Right, so the, 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 the combining the results is very good. All right, so as we talked a little bit about processes and why not do this. Okay, so so I think in the interest of time, let me do this. Um, I don't want to go through this stuff it's too much. Let me. Okay, so let me get the thread states. Right, so the the user thread and kernel thread stuff is in the slides. It's not. Uh, ter terribly important stuff. I wish we had time to talk about it, but I, th I think it's been, we've had a great class today. There's a lot of questions that we're really happy about that. So let me finish up by talking about thread states, because this, this is stuff that you will need to know, right? So when we, now we have this thread abstraction, and now that we have thread abstraction, we can start talking about it in abstract terms. So we talk about threads on the system as being in one of, typically one of three states, right? So a thread could be running, a thread could be ready, and a thread may be blocked. Sometimes we call this waiting, sometimes we call this sleeping, right? So what do you guys think it means for a thread to be running? What does it mean for a thread to be running? It's, CPU. it's using the CPU, right? It's running on the CPU. What about a thread that's ready? No, it's not. It is a runnable thread. It is a thread that could be running, but it is not actually running. It stopped waiting for waiting to be scheduled. Right. What about, okay, Malik, come back to you. You got, the, you got the answer to the third question early. Waiting. waiting. What, what was your answer? Waiting for something back to finish. Right, waiting for something to happen. This is a thread that cannot be run right now. Right? It cannot be run until something happens, until disk read finishes, until you know, another thread releases a lock or something. So, so even if I wanted to schedule the thread, I can't. Even if I had cores that were available, I can't run these threads. Right? They cannot be run. They, something else has to happen on the system to make it ready, okay? So, thread state transitions. How do threads go from the running state to the ready state? I was running on the CPU, and then I'm ready to run on the CPU. What, what do we call that? CPU. So, these are mechanisms, but, but we, we think of this as the thread being, how about descheduled? The operating system, because again, the thread didn't ask for anything to happen. It didn't perform something, didn't perform a system call that required that it wait around for something to happen. It was running, it was really happy running on the CPU, and then suddenly it's ready. And this means that the operating system, time runner would happen, the operating system decided that this thread was no longer going to use the CPU in order for another thread to run. Okay? What about running to waiting? This guy System call, yes, right? System call usually requires the thread wait around for the kernel to finish what it was what it asked the kernel to do. There are asynchronous system calls I don't want to talk about. Maybe later. Right? But generally you think of a system call as being synchronous. I ask the kernel to read some data from disk, and when that read completes, the kernel will restart me and the data will be where I asked the kernel to put it. Right? So when that happens, the kernel, the thread goes into the waiting queue, waiting for this whatever it asked to happen. Alright, waiting to ready. What does this mean? Hmm. Right, whatever the thread was waiting for happened, right? Disk read completed, and the disk and the data has been loaded into the process adapter space. You know, the, the signal that I was waiting for uh, happened or what? All right, ready to running. What is this? This is scheduling, right? This is a thread being scheduled. The kernel has chosen this thread to run. So it's being moved out of the ready queue onto the running, and then running to terminate it. 
It's done, right? And, and maybe it wanted to be done, or maybe it didn't want to be done. So I might have called exit, or I might have hit some sort of fail exception that caused the kernel to decide that I couldn't continue. Yeah? Do all kinds of system calls put the thread in the waiting state? No. So in certain cases, right, there, there would be two cases, right? One is, and it, there are these, there are what are called asynchronous system calls, meaning I'm going to ask the kernel to do the read, but I'm not going to wait for the read to complete. Right? And then there needs to be some way for the kernel to tell me when the read complete. Right? The other thing that could happen is I might do a system call. There are system calls like, you know, get my process ID, right? That don't require a lot of work on the kernel's part, right? It's like look it up in the structure and it back. Some of these are actually now implemented in libraries in user space. Why? Why would you implement something like that in library? It's fast or why? I don't have to switch it to the kernel, right? Remember, there's this context switch overhead, so if I could do that in user space, it could be. Yeah? Uh, this thing about the slipping, I mean, is slipping voluntarily or not voluntarily? Can the kernel put some try to sleep, or it's actually going to just put it to ready instead of sleep? Or how to so, so remember, when I make a system call that is blocking system call, right? Until that system call completes, the thread cannot be run, right? Because a blocking system call, the thread has asked me to create the illusion that it did a read and that read completed immediately and it kept running. So it's the same state sleeping and waiting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I. I. I, I think. It, I'll have to look that up and see if there really is. Is, no, I mean, the, the terminology is, is kind of interchangeable, right? You can say that a thread is finished waiting, or a thread wakes up, right? I wake up a sleeping thread, right? You know, it depends on how lazy you think the thread is, right? Like, does the thread stand around waiting for the wait to complete, or does it, like, take a nap and ask the kernel to wake it up? All right, so, so next, okay, so, so next week, we're going to talk about synchronization. So we've created this threading abstraction. We've implemented it using context switches. We've talked a little bit about some of the overheads that are required and the states the thread that, can, that the thread can be in. But now we've got to deal with the details, man. We've got to like work out how our thread's going to coordinate. What kind of primitives is the kernel going to provide, especially the kernel threads? Because let me ask you this. What is the most important multi-threaded application running on your system? The operating system. Right, so we're going to talk a little bit about how to handle concurrency inside the operating system, which is pretty critical. If user applications get concurrency wrong, who cares? They die and they live everything, right? If the kernel gets concurrency wrong, then it's, you know, right? Um, so assignment one is going to be out on Monday. Uh, assignment, so I've set this up so there's a nice stuff scaling here. The stuff we're going to talk about next week is the stuff you're going to be building for assignment one, right? So it'll only be two weeks, but you'll have, by the end of next week, You'll have all the conceptual tools that you'll need to do it. And I think your understanding of synchronization and the synchronization primitives will be enriched by the fact that you're going to be using and building some of them. Yeah, question. That's the weirdest way to spell giants that I've ever seen. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Don't really giants spell with a G, I guess. All right, I will see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend.